And, and actually, I didn't really know what to expect. Uh, Eric uh, gave me a, a sort of a, okay, we want to talk about linking strategy to execution. I took it literally. But then I, I realized that you had some, some maybe slightly different uh, expectation in terms of, of uh, the headline with how to, to build um, exploring uh, learning organizations uh, within, within big companies. And I will actually touch on that and, and sort of comment on that a bit, because that was essentially what we tried to do at Sony and what, what I did a lot at, at BlackBerry as well, uh, working a lot with innovation and, and how to bring innovation into, and, and agile innovation into uh, big or organizations. Um, and actually, you, if you take a couple of ste steps back, uh, you can ask yourself the question, why would you like to build a, a, a learning, uh, exploring organization within, within an established company? Um, most of the time it has to do with the fact that this company, whatever it is, has acknowledged that, okay, we're not innovative enough. Maybe they have sur uh, employee surveys that, that states that we have to be more innovative and the stakeholders and, and the shareholders, they expect that well, you're not innovative enough. You're, you're, you're uh, losing momentum on the market. Uh, but in most cases, these initiatives, sometimes very well-funded initiatives, uh, fall flat uh, for some weird reason. So you have this nice idea of a strategy how to, to move it to the market, but then it just falls for various reasons. And I mean, there have been literally hundreds of books uh, written on this topic, uh, Innovator's Dilemma, and those, those books that you probably have heard of. By the way, how many here are from a big company? Uh, how many are in startups? So big company? Define big company. Like uh, big enterprise, established uh, in a certain market, more than 100 employees, typically. And startups? Okay, so it's a fair mix. So hopefully there will be something useful for, for both, <laughs> both here. Um, so what I think, uh, bef before you actually sort of dive into this, you have to take a couple of steps back. When you define a strategy for your, your, uh, your enterprise, regardless if it's a small startup or if it's a big, big company, you know, need to know what environment you're, you're uh, executing in, so to speak, or where, where your business is. And this, this is one way of looking at it. Uh, and uh, on the, on the uh, vertical axis here, you have... have uh, a level of, of uncertainty. So low uncertainty here and, and high uncertainty here. V very volatile market here and, and very v well established market down here. Uh, on the horizontal axis, you have ability to shape the future. So for you or your, your uh, connected partners or, or, uh, or stakeholders, you have a low uh, possibility to, to uh, shape the future when you go forward or do you have a high uh, ability or a high opportunity to shape the future. So depending on where you're in, um, this, this is very loose. Is it supposed to be like this? So depending on where you're in, what quadrants you need to act slightly differently. And uh, thanks. Yeah. Um, oops, come on. Nope. So, uh, the trouble or the, the, the challenge here for a big company is that in many cases there are in multiple places at the same time. Uh, and they have to address that. And they can't use one strategy to address all these, these segments at the same time. Um, and you can definitely be innovative and, and drive new things to the market in all these, these sectors, but you have to apply different strategies to it. Uh, so if we dive just a little bit deeper, and, and actually, the reason I'm, I'm talking about this or trying to paint this picture is because this uh, has implications all the way down to how you prioritize a roadmap, for instance, and what features and what activities, and not just product features, but what activities as a company do you need to, to put in your game plan, short term, medium term, and long term. Um, so if we just uh, start in this end here, because this is the easiest one, and this is actually where many, much of the Typical strategy literature, I mean, uh, take SWOT analysis or, or uh, Porter's Five uh, Forces or, or uh, Boston Consulting Group matrices, what, what have you. Uh, a lot of the traditional uh, educations are in this sector here. Where you typically analyze the competition, you lo look at uh, sort of gaps in markets, 
you create some sort of tac tactical plan to, to move uh, into these markets, and then you execute. And you can rely on, the, on your organization, uh, the structure in your organization to execute on this, because it's a well-known, uh, for you, a well-known territory. It's a low level of uncertainty. But then again, the possibility to actually change things, fundamentally, radically change things, is, is pretty limited. And you kind of acknowledge that, and that's fine. Uh, and actually, in this area, you can obviously apply very agile techniques and things, but in many cases, it's, it's just you can just as well use any, any old-school waterfall or whatever, because it's so high predictability, predictabi uh, whatever, yeah. Uh, and, but, but it's, in, in a sense, pretty boring. So you won't, you won't uh, sort of uh, change the world or move the needle uh, in, a, in a big, big way here. Typically, um, I would say, uh, you, like, you could say, uh, like, oil, gas, and mining typically is a good example. But uh, automotive, um, before Tesla, I guess. Uh, yeah, exactly. Food, uh, steel, uh, wood industry, whatever, that type of thing. I would say, actually, mobile phone industry in cycles end up here. But then something happens and it changes the, the game. Um, so, moving up here, more, more higher uh, level of uncertainty, uh, but still very low, low possibility for you as a company to impact. That it requires a quite different approach to how you build a str uh, your, your strategy. Uh, and actually, in many cases, the only strategy is to be fast. And this is typically what you see in many of the like, Asian ODMs and, and, and um, uh, subcontractors to, to bigger companies. That, that's what they're doing. Quickly, they, they scout the market for opportunities. Consultancies of various kinds are doing this. Uh, you rapidly iterate on these opportunities, see what essentially throw spaghetti at the wall, see what sticks, uh, and then you move on that. And when it falls down, you throw a new spaghetti on the wall, and then you just, you just have a, f a high pace. And the interesting thing here is that you don't really need a vision to do this. You can just follow the market. Um, actually, you don't need much of a vision here either, but uh, it helps a little bit. But here you, you can just, uh, you can do very good business there, but you need to be, be optimizing for speed. Whereas hi here it's more optimizing for, for be biggest on the market or on a particular market. Moving into this, it becomes more interesting, I would say. And this is where you find more of the startup world uh, or traditional companies that wants to disrupt or, or wants to renew themselves. Um, and here, you're, you're still in a fairly, so Tesla is actually a pretty good example. It's a fairly stable market, the automotive market. But what they, they had was a very strong leader, obviously, with Elon Musk, uh, that relentlessly uh, was leading, or is leading with a vision. Uh, in his case, riding on the on the sort of mega trend that that uh, electric cars will be the future. We don't just know when and how. It could be technology based on technology breakthroughs as well that radically changes the scenario for this into this. But the the, the leading factor here is that you relentlessly uh, push towards this vision. And the thing here is that you can say that okay we we have to listen to the customer we have to continuously keep an uh, ear to the ground to see what the customers are saying yes of course but you can't sort of divert from the vision because the customers in in many cases here don't really know what they 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 want and i, I think this is typically also what happened with uh, obviously with uh, apple introducing the the iPhone and the iPad and so on. Uh, fairly traditional, well, maybe not the iPad, but the iPhone for sure. Traditional market, uh, pretty stable, and then they had a vision relentlessly pursued by, by Steve Jobs. Um, actually, if you take my company where I'm at, at now, we're probably somewhere in between here. We're in a pretty stable market, but we have some elements of, of disruption and vision that we're trying to pursue. Um, so, so we actually had a, qu uh, or we can dive into that later on, but you could start thinking, okay, uh, lean startup, where do you apply this in, in, uh, or that type of agile methods? And actually, I think to some degree, if you're, you're doing it wrong, it can actually hurt if you're here, if you, you're too much into sort of literal interpretation of lean startup in terms of you have to listen to the customer. You should, you should obviously listen to the customer, understand the needs, yes, for sure. 
but you need to have your own vision as well. Um, then we have this, where it's really high level of uncertainty. You don't really know what the future will be. You can't predict it, but you have a feeling you're big enough or, or you, you have the, the sort of ecosystem that can actually shape the future, regardless of what it's going to be. And if, interesting, uh, interestingly enough, Apple kind of moved from, when they introduced the iPhone, moved, moved from being here to actually moving up here. And I don't think it was on purpose, it just happened. And they created the ecosystem, the platform collaborate for co collaboration and so on. Uh, so that was a pretty interesting journey. And I think now they're, they're sort of gradually going down here again. I, I, would, I would assume, actually, that they look at the market f when it comes to the iPhone uh, a lot based on these things. Traditional kind of, okay, market size, what's entry barriers, blah, 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 all those things. Uh, an, an interesting thing is that at, uh, when I was at TAT, I don't know how much you know about TAT. We did uh, mobile user interface software, but we were also a design agency, you can say, uh, which then wa was sold to, to BlackBerry. We were a little bit all over the place in this, actually, and applied various types of, of strategy approaches to, to, uh, to sort of uh, m understand this space. And we, we actually made some experiments up here. I was just gonna gonna show one of one of those. It's it was uh, essentially an attempt to uh, to uh, we understand. We we kind of un understood that we were too small to actually make any difference on our own. So what we tried to do was, and this was well, 2008 or so, uh, and and the, the sort of uh, the buzzword those years were open innovation and those things. So we tried to do an experiment around actually gathering a lot of industry influencers and, and we had a fair bun bunch of sort of followers uh, early days and we created a, a sort of a visionary video. Today it's not very visionary, but at the time it was quite unusual. And, and what, uh, what was interesting was that that actually managed to mobilize a bunch of different uh, companies in our sector to move towards that, uh, that vision. Uh, we'll show you if it works. I'm not going to show the whole thing, and it's it's uh, again it's an old video as well, so you have to bear in mind that this was 2008. Uh, so this the vision, and this is just some some uh, promo stuff, whatever. We needed to do that, but uh, 2014, so it's two two years ago. Uh, today, this is obviously not any any uh, fantastic novel stuff. But what was interesting about this, what when we when we sort of exposed this, and it was pretty pretty big uh, take up. Uh, we had some like 10 million views or whatever on on uh, YouTube, which was pretty good for this type of video. And it sort of brought in technologies, user in interface uh, paradigms, uh, interaction methods, and all kinds of things. And uh, after, after releasing this, we, we got contacted by a whole bunch of different stakeholders in, in the ecosystem that wanted to make this vision come true and build this new future where ever anyone could contribute into this, uh, these different screens uh, all over the place. Um, so, so that was a pretty interesting experiment. Actually, we, we, we didn't really uh, sort of live to see the, the the end of this because we uh, we got acquired after but and actually the the story is that this video was what uh, was circulated around within blackberry then eventually led them to think that these guys are really smart they're the orchestrators of of the future kind of um yeah yeah <laughs> but but i think it, what it does is that illustrates the power in how to because th this is also what, what we try to do in BlackBerry and in, in later on to some degree in Sony. How do you, when you're a big company, how do you align a big company around a strategy or a vision? It's really, really difficult. It may be distributed uh, across different regions, geographical regions. There are different types of, of uh, incentives driving the, the various uh, departments and all kinds of things. It's really difficult. But actually, use visual storytelling is is a really powerful tool, um, and, and uh, yeah. So so uh, uh, we can skip. Um, so with all this as a background, um, and I'm not going to be super lengthy here. So this is my I only have one more slide. Uh, 
I've seen, I've probably seen, or I have seen more strategies fail than, than succeed. Uh, so, so it's quite pretty interesting actually to, to, uh, to look a little bit into why they fail. If you know all these things, and, and in many cases, actually, I think it's, it's because of the, the, the first thing here, that you don't really know where you are in this whole puzzle uh, or this whole picture. Uh, so you apply the wrong approach, overall approach, to building the strategy in the first place. It doesn't really fit where you're in. Uh, and you see some, some new interesting, uh, I don't know, blog post or article about the new way of doing strategy and apply that and it doesn't work. Um, I think uh, uh, maybe an even bigger reason for it to fail is that maybe you get this right, you're in the right place, but you're not aligned with your internal capabilities. Uh, I think this is very common when you try to move from, if you call this area, to the area where you, you're in a more visionary uh, mode. You have a, need to have a visionary leader. So the culture and the, the shared values in the company, and, and in particular the leadership, is not suitable for, for this new venture. They're not simply not geared to, uh, to drive that type of company. Um, and you need, in some cases, guys like Elon Musk or Steve Jobs to actually make it happen. Uh, and uh, I think in some cases, like Amazon, I would say is a good example of some, some where you actually can have both a sustaining uh, business and then apply new, new sort of curves of revenue uh, or new categories of revenue uh, under Bezos. So he, he, he managed to, to do that. But, but I think that's a, that's a big problem. I, and I take an example from, from BlackBerry, for instance. When they realized that they were screwed when it comes to, to their hardware business for phones, and they realized we need to move into services. That's where we're going to survive, s software and services. This essentially, uh, from like top level senior management all the way down like three levels, everyone had were let go. And they changed it and brought in completely new people. And now they're actually, well, the jury is still out, but I think they're, they're doing pretty okay. Uh, not at all the same company they were five years ago, but they're still around at least. What's much more easy to, to influence, obviously, is the processes and, and the organizational structure. That you can change pretty easily. But this is, this is hard if it's not aligned with your, your strategy. And then, obviously, competences and so on um, in terms of skill sets. The third thing, uh, which is a big, big issue in, in a big company, but actually in a, in, a, in a startup, it can be this as well. How, you how do you communicate this? new sort of genius strategy t that you've made up? How do, you, how do you make everyone believe it and understand it? And I use videos like, like I showed, could be one, one way, but there are so many different uh, things driving organizations. So it's, it's very easy that you have internal silos and it's difficult to actually communicate and, and transfer the, the sentiment around uh, your strategy uh, among these. And also when it comes to external stakeholders, it's difficult. And lastly, I think uh, this, is this is something you see a lot as well, is that you have this massive strategy, you're going to do this, we're going to claim this market, we're going to et cetera, et cetera. But you, you don't align it with the actual cost structure and the resources you have available. Uh, so, so you're placing too many bets. It's like a thousand miles wide, an inch deep. You're, you're simply not putting enough force around a few areas. And in particular, again, if you're in, if you recall uh, the, the chart, if you're in this space, and if you want to move here, you can't have five efforts trying to move into to a new disruptive business. At one single point, I think almost regardless how big the company is, you can have one. And if you look at Apple, they, they, they essentially push for one at the time. I mean, they pushed for the iPhone, then they pushed for the iPad, and then they took the Apple Watch and so on. They never launch three disruptive things at the same time. Because even given their size, they need to put all the efforts uh, behind one thing. So, let's say that, so now I'm getting to the last slide. Let's say you have all these things in place, you're checking, yeah, we're, we're good. Uh, how do you put it into practice? And there are so many different things you can, you can dive into here, but I just wanted to leave you with, with one thing. I I've, have found throughout the years really useful to always get back to. So when you, you don't know what to do, you can always get back to this. Um, and it's really three elements, pretty basic really. But obviously 
addressing the user needs. Do, do we, with this new venture, this new product uh, strategy, address a valuable problem? I mean, that's a given. We can use all the tools and methods and UX uh, design methodologies and whatnot to, to do that. Can we build it? Do we have the technology? Do we have the know-how? Do we have the right skill set to actually build it? But then I think what's often forgotten is, can we actually sell it? And this one comes in many cases last. And I, I, I'm guilty to this uh, myself, actually. Coming from, from TAT, we were very good at this. We, we never cared about this. Really stupid, but we didn't. Um, we just uh, sort of hoped for the best, kind of. Not really, but... Uh, and I think what, what's important here is that uh, in, a, in a sort of build, measure, learn kind of way, you need to apply it in all these different uh, segments at the same time and validate all key assumptions around your product, your whole product, and not just the features, but the whole offering, value offering to the customer. Uh, but then be very careful on where you put the efforts at any given moment. And they are very interconnected. So sometimes you put all the effort here, sometimes you might put, put all here, and sometimes here. But you must not forget them. And I think, uh, I think Mark Andreessen put it pretty, pretty well, that in some cases we see people using Lean Startup, and they do this really well, and they sort of understand the needs, and they apply all the, like, the mom tests and whatnot, uh, and they build the products and have the features and all those things. But they they kind of use it as an excuse not to go out and sell it, try to really sell it. And I, I mean, I'm of the firm belief that the real, the real, the thing that really trumps everything is, is real customer traction. People that actually pay their own money to get your, your, uh, the value that you're providing. Uh, because that, that, will, that will be the ultimate test that this, this need is actually valuable. Um, so, um, yeah, actually this w with this I, I wanted to, to end. Um, and then when it comes to the tactics, you can, you can apply so many different uh, methodologies, of course. Uh, and I guess we will hear more about that uh, 